The song is called These Kids We Knew.
Hi, I'm Maddie, sitting down with another of the Currents virtual sessions. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Rostam. You just heard his songs In a River and These Kids We Knew. Rostam, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Yeah. Where are you at right now? I'm in my studio in California. Sweet. Is that where you have kind of spent the bulk of the past year? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> Yes, mostly. I have been I've been making a lot of music. When the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. I was almost sort of coming to the end of writing this new album Change Phobia and I needed alone time in order to finish it uh in order to go down, you know, every road mm -hmm. that, you know, the sort of like <sighs> however many hours it takes to just feel like you really finished recording a song and it's as good as it could be so i needed that time so i have spent a lot of time in the studio finishing songs mm -hmm. as like a career musician who's been busy for so many years um, and constantly on the road do you feel like your kind of perspective on making this record was influenced by you know this kind of opportunity to have that stillness and alone time <sighs> There's, you know, it's interesting. The song These Kids We Knew was pretty mm -hmm. much the only song that I wrote during the pandemic. And it came mm -hmm. out of me very quickly. And it came out of me while I had a fever. And later I would, I would discover that that fever was from COVID-19. But most of these songs I spent, I probably spent like two and a half or three years writing the lyrics mm -hmm. over time. And and really taking taking my time to write the lyrics. Is that similar to the songwriting process that you had for uh, Half Light back in 2017, or is that a different approach for you? Well, <laughs> for, this, for the for the record Half Light, I spent eight years kind of picking up and putting mm -hmm. down those songs, and some of the songs evolved, others not much. So this album was much more condensed. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say my lyric writing process was was influenced by working with Hamilton Lighthouser um, because the way that he writes lyrics is so much about revision over time. And he taught me how to use the Notes app that's in the iPhone and on the iPad and in Mac OS and just lets you be able to revise lyrics, whether you're sitting at your computer or mm -hmm. on your phone or in any place. So... I kind of learned from him that there's something nice about sort of taking small minutes like right before bed or right when you wake up and, and revising your lyrics. Do you songs start with lyrics for you or is that um, something that kind of comes after you have the music already kind of in your head? I think oftentimes it is the music that starts, but once that happens, I'll start to create like 
a notes file where I'll throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Like almost like I'll throw a line down that doesn't have a melody written yet, but just a line that I feel is a lyric that belongs in a song. And I'll sometimes try to figure out how to make that lyric work in the context of a song. Other times I'll write melodies and the melodies will then need lyrics to, you know, become a song. But yes, it, it usually is the music that starts things. But I also do like being able to write lyrics without them having to necessarily conform to a melody. So in that way, it's like lyric writing for the sake of lyric writing, like saying things because you want them to be said mm -hmm. in a song. Yeah, it sounds like those elements can kind of like converge and morph in, into their own things in different ways there. That's interesting. Yeah, um, the sonic world that we kind of have entered with these singles that have been released so far off of Change Phobia um, is different than what we heard on Half Light. Half Light, I feel like, had a lot of kind of chambery strings and um, that was working within that sound base. Where did you kind of think about coming from for this, the way that Change Phobia sounds? Well, I wanted to take a step away from... Mm -hmm harpsichords and cellos and violins and string arrangements. In some ways, the album Half Light was a project where I wanted to blur the line between what was a string arrangement and what was songwriting. And oftentimes the songs started with a string arrangement and then became a song over time. Mm -hmm. um, on this record, I said no strings. And I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to use the saxophone as this sort of one of the central sounds of the record. And I wanted the mm -hmm. sax to sort of fill the album with um, a, a mood and an atmosphere that that was just so fresh to me. I just, I hadn't, I felt like there wasn't enough sax that referenced mid-century jazz in songs. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, I was trying to push myself to write songs that referenced a certain era of, of saxophone music. That's super interesting. Do you play saxophone or do you have anyone that you've been working with on the album who has been playing the bulk of it? Yes. Yeah, so there's one person um, and we met in March of 2018. His name is Henry Solomon. And um, he played on about half the songs on the record the first day that I met him. I had all these parts written and I had ideas and I also asked him to improvise. And then over the three years that I was finishing the record, he would come in at different times and play things at different stages. Um, and simultaneously, I brought him in to play on the Heim album, Women in Music Part 3. So he played the saxophone on that album as well. So he's definitely been an important part of the sound of a lot of the music that I've made in the last few years. Absolutely. When you're working on a solo record like Chains Phobia, do you have a lot of collaborators that you work with like Henry, or is it something that you mostly kind of are doing on your own? On this record, you know, it really was a lot about having Henry sort of mm -hmm. do the things that I could not do on my own. And in some ways that was to play the sax, but also to reference eras of jazz that mm -hmm. he's much more fluent in than I am. I could say I love a certain era of jazz, but Henry understands that music differently. Whereas mm -hmm. with classical music, I can say I love a certain era of classical music, but I can also tell you that I know exactly what's going on mechanically and I know how to write music like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how to write bebop melodies. And I didn't really want to try because I think there's a component of them that's so like tied to improvisation. So mm -hmm. a lot of the sax parts that Henry played were improvised. Um, some of them were things that I wrote out, um, but a lot of them just came off the top of his head and I would record like 30 or 40 takes and then I would edit a performance out of his improvisations. But yeah, I didn't have very many collaborators on this album. 
Mm -hmm. Do you think that writing in this sort of jazz bebop world was a challenge for you? Or was it kind of refreshing to get away from, like you were saying, classical that you have such a sort of deep, intense knowledge of? I think the answer is both. It was challenging Mm -hmm. and I wanted to challenge myself and I kind of wanted to redefine myself a little bit. I, I wanted to change how people saw me as a producer and a composer. And I, I, I think the, you know, the way to do that was to do things that I hadn't done before. Mm -hmm. We are going to hear two more songs, um, and then we'll come back to chat for a second. Here are two songs off the upcoming album, out June 4th. Here's Kinney and Forerunner. Second time, I didn't put up a fight 
I take the keys down off the hood I pick you up from work We stick to the straight roads up the west coast And I feel a part of your slide When the trucks drive by I feel them sway side to side Yeah, underneath the blanket on the backseat I'm going station to station on the dock Don't wanna be pretty like a girl I think I'm pretty much your boy You wear a baseball cap all the time I'm keeping up in the passenger door Sleeping behind the wheel Pulled over on the freeway For a stolen bed Long, long time Take off a ship for me I'm waiting down the street Take all the time you want to Come, come, come Last time we did it Both felt a hit different Flying down across the front seats Used to leave you weightless and listless When the trucks drive by I feel them sway side to side I used to keep you up all night Used to drive when I got tired Sleeping behind the wheel Pulled over on the freeway Four and a stolen bed Long, long, long Take off the ship for me Down the street, take all the time you want to come home. This far and we've been good together. I think we're getting close. I think we're getting closer. We got this far and we've been good together. Sleeping behind the wheel, pulled over home free. We're far and a stolen plate. Long, long, long. Take off the ship for me. I'm waiting down the street. Take all the time you I'm Maddie here with another of the Currents Virtual Sessions. Today we're sitting down with Rostam here in some songs off the upcoming album Change Phobia. You just heard a Forerunner and Kinney. Uh, again, Rostam, thank you for being here. It's nice to be here. I w- have been really intrigued by the sort of release format that you've been um, approaching Change Phobia with. Because now at the time that we're having this conversation, there's six of the 11 songs out, the first six on the album. Um, what was your sort of thought process behind releasing those songs in that manner? I, yeah, this this is not a significant uh, issue, but I do think it's five, isn't it? Is it not five? Six it? That are, I think it's five that are out and six okay. that are remaining. Okay, that's pro- you probably you definitely know them better than I do. But yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> um, I think for for me, what it was sort of about was wanting every song to have a little bit of life in in the universe. Um, and I think in this day and age, when the album comes out, there's, you know, with, you know, there's this gravity that happens where everything seems to be 
in outer space all of a sudden and 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 anything's possible and then an album comes out and it's almost like within a couple of days it it can feel like it didn't come out at all and and mm-hmm. it's gone so i think there is something nice about building up some anticipation and i think traditionally people did release songs bef- you know leading up to an album and then they were able to focus on songs after the album came out but nowadays it's i think it's pretty hard to get people to focus or be excited about songs after an album is out so you do have to sort of change the order a little bit um but that said i could also one day imagine putting out an album every song on the same day you know there's mm-hmm. something cool about putting out an album and its entire release is an event absolutely so you might see that for me and I also like the idea of, of of putting out some songs in a surprising way in the future. So mm-hmm. I, I would expect that. I'd expect a surprise. Okay. I'm making a mental note of it and looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. I've been listening to you as a listener, just sort of this. I like that the songs that you released are sequential because I feel like I've almost kind of gotten to experience this first half of an album in, you know, the way it's meant to be heard. Um, is album sequencing something you think a lot about in your records? I did on this album. Mm-hmm. And I, it was important to me to try to play this album for friends in sequence. So I would make an MP3 of the entire album, you know, a single 38 minute MP3. Mm-hmm. And I would just sit down and press play with friends. And I would say, you know, we can talk a little bit or we don't have to talk much, but it's just going to play. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was good for me. Um, and I think it was good for the process. Mm hmm. But yes, yeah, sequencing was important. What kind of things were you like noticing and working on and revising in those like early listenings with sequencing? <sighs> That's a good question. I would say my original thought was to have from the back of a cab be track one. And that mm-hmm. was true for years and years. And then my mastering engineer, Emily Lazar, who I've, you know, made like nine albums with this is the ninth Mm -hmm. album she really pushed me to consider putting these kids first and making from the back of a cab second and i tried it and i liked what it did i liked how it sort of created um almost like an introduction and i i know i knew that from the back of a cab was an emotional song so I, you know, some people have told some people told me that the song made them feel like they were about to cry, even on first listen. Mm-hmm. So I think there was something good about about getting there by track two and and not not starting the album in such an extremely emotional place. Yeah, it kind of gives you a second to get into that world before you're kind of hit with that emotional track. Um, is there anything that we should be looking forward to on the second half of the album that hasn't kind of been introduced yet as an idea or a sound in the first half, or is it kind of consistent with what we've heard so far? Well, yeah, one of the songs that I think is, to me, was one of the most controversial in in choosing to Mm -hmm. have it be on the album was Kinney, which Mm -hmm. we performed live for this session. Um, and that song, it has a drum and bass feel. Uh, I think the first half sort of sounds like Radiohead. Mm-hmm. And the second half kind of sounds like Nirvana or the Pixies. And I grew up with grunge music, but mm-hmm. I have not really referenced grunge music in the music that I've made in my life. And this was kind of the first time where... You know, it is my own kind of mathy Middle Eastern version of grunge. Mm-hmm. So it's it's its own flavor. I wouldn't say that it's strictly grunge, but I was worried that some people might hear something that's so heavy sounding and mm-hmm. feel like, you know, it wasn't for them. Like, I always joked, I'm going to lose the grandparents with this one. <laughs> Yeah. What what kind of ma- helped in making your final decision to include that song on the album? I think I sent it to a couple people I trusted and and at least one person was like I think this might be my favorite on the album. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, it's going to be some people's favorite. It might be one that 
turns off some people, but it's going to be some people's favorite. Mm -hmm. And I think it's okay to have songs that are controversial on an album. So I went, I went ahead with it. That's an exciting thing to look forward to for the album, uh, which is coming out on June 4th. I just wanted to ask quick about um, how does it feel to write an album for yourself? I know you talked about sort of spending years with these lyrics in comparison to um, all the records that you produced in the past few years. I know you mentioned the Haim album and you've worked with Claro and Charlie XCX and lots of other favorites. Um, how does the songwriting process feel different when you're working on your own? We, you know, people have asked me about characters and mm -hmm. I can't really do that for my own project. Maybe that would change in the future. But when I write songs for the Rostam album, mm -hmm. I'm really like writing from my own experiences. And they're all, all the lyrics are inspired by things that did happen to me or me remembering things that happened to me. So... It is very personal, but when I write songs with other people, it's also personal. And so much of that work is one-on-one. -on -one. And so mm -hmm. it, does, it doesn't feel totally removed, but it, I would just describe it as personal in a different way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that getting to work with people and experiencing like their own version of their, their personal um, changes the way that you look at your own? If it does, I, I won't know for five or ten years. So, yes, I, I, I love working with other people, and I'm always learning from everybody that I work with. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, I'm, I'm certainly constantly influenced by the, the amazing people that I get to work with, and I, I feel mm -hmm. lucky that I get to work with them. But can I know how? I, I don't think I can. Not, not, not anytime soon. Thank you again, Rostam, for sitting down here with us at The Current. We're going to hear one more song off the upcoming album. The song is called To Communicate. 